Life Without Porn by Brad Robinson Chapter 1 12 Years Addicted I count him braver who overcomes his desires than him who conquers his enemies, for the hardest victory is over self. Aristotle In this audiobook, I want to talk about how porn impacted my life, as well as the cognitive and behavioral consequences of consistent porn use. Why does this endless amount of explicit material hook us into a destructive pattern that could last years and decades? I certainly did not know I was addicted. Only in my 12th year of porn use did I realize this may be a problem. I want to talk about my experiences with porn and why I decided to challenge myself to live a porn and masturbation free lifestyle. Also, what is life like without it? Coming across the first ever pornographic image to ever hit my eyes was an experience I could never forget. My 15 year old self was both aroused and guilty. I knew it was wrong. I knew when the access to the website said 18 plus, I was in territory that was beyond me. As I sit on my family computer in the dining area of my old childhood home, I click and a rush of excitement fills up my head. I look around the kitchen, no one to be seen. I am curious yet nervous. What if my parents catch me as I breach the contract of what I should or shouldn't be looking at? They never told me not to, but the sight with its explicit warnings of adult content and the feelings of guilt send me the message that this is wrong. As a young kid, only having seen sex and naked women on TV, I am curious to explore the more extreme content on the internet. In this day and age, back in the mid-2000s, the best chance of me catching explicit content was the after hours on the Showcase Network, and you'd be lucky to even catch something erotic. But looking back, I remember my curiosity over sex and women starting to percolate at this time. With the access of TV and the internet, I started to explore this curiosity. At this time, there was cable TV, a computer with a hard drive the size of a mini fridge, and magazines propped up at the back of the convenience store. The access to sexually explicit material was becoming more and more easy to come by. The thing is, I had to wait up at night to catch a glimpse of a softcore sex scene on a TV show, or dodge the passing eyes of a family member as I sneak a peek of a nude woman on the family computer. If I heard footsteps, I would quickly click off the site, clear the history, and hope no spam pop-ups would expose my sneaky activities. The first time I liked a girl was back in elementary school. I was in 6th or 7th grade when strong emotions of love entered my space of consciousness. I remember the images of this girl bouncing around my mind incessantly. I was feeling strong urges of desire and lust that completely overwhelmed me. I didn't know what to do. Waves of strong emotion were flooding my inner being, but unfortunately, I never worked up the courage to tell her how I felt. I would often play with her outside and puff up my chest and act silly whenever she was near, but nothing came of it. When I transitioned to high school, The amount of time I got to spend with her decreased and my feelings for her drifted away. That was my first experience of love and attraction, a thunderstorm of emotions that completely shook me to my core. Then later, when I was introduced to porn, the desire for real love and connection reduced dramatically. My real-world experiences lessened in sensitivity as I plugged my brain into the matrix of porn. When I think about it, I now think of the many years of which I was conditioned to this overly influential matrix. 
It was a means to subject myself to the raw feminine body for which I was unable to accomplish in reality. Why bother with the real thing when I can have endless amounts of naked women on my computer while I just sit here alone in my room? There was that possibility of rejection if I were to approach that girl in school. The possibility of humiliation. Embarrassment. Why should I take that chance? In high school, my shyness started to magnify even more. I was a short, thin kid with braces who had no self-confidence. If there was a girl I liked, I thought, hey, there's no way she will go out with me. Porn was the easy way out. There is no rejection here. When I started to increase porn use in 11th grade, I became concerned whether or not it had any harm over my health. So I googled, is porn and masturbation safe? After finding out according to Google that it was, I continued to do it. It provided me with the all clear, the go ahead. I always had this original guilty feeling that this habit wasn't right even after finding out from the internet that it can be a healthy act for a young boy. Throughout my 20s, after each porn use and ejaculation, I felt guilty, drained, uneasy. But by the time I was 25, this habit had been strong for 10 years, and it was all I knew. Habitual. I didn't know a life without it. The desire for porn and the feelings accompanied by the orgasm became my normal. I was desensitized by the after effects, or so I thought. When I think about the kids now in high school growing up with smartphones in their pockets, I wonder, how are they getting along with this endless explicit content on the internet? I wonder how boys today deal with their changing hormones and desires with this portal to endless naked women in their pan pockets. When I was in high school, I had a flip phone where the most exciting thing you can do with it was record silly voice messages and take photos. Does the message of how harmful porn is make itself known to the public, especially the younger males? I personally don't think so. When those raging hormones kick in, there's no stopping that urge for sexual curiosity. Chapter 2. Finding the Path People want to jump to peace without going to war. David Goggins An addiction is when you try to stop doing something, but when you try to stop, you can't. It has a hold over you. It pulls you in one direction. Throughout my 20s, I used porn as a means to escape the mundane reality I was living. Porn was exciting, stimulating, and it certainly blocked out any pain and insecurities I had when engaging with it. I would look at it twice a day, even at work. I would spend many minutes in the bathroom transfixed over my phone screen. Many times during the day, the thought of porn would enter my mind. It could even be the attraction of a woman on the street that would trigger this urge. Then, I would usually give in without giving it a second thought. The habit became ingrained. If you practice a habit long enough, it becomes second nature. Even the feelings before the action itself becomes a trigger. You feel the desire and then you act. And eventually, you'll act without ever noticing the desire. For over 10 years, the women walking in the streets, the women in movies, TV, and advertisements would all be triggers for me. To paint you a bigger picture, let's say you saw an attractive person walk by and you feel a strong attraction. Then you go and watch porn. What happens? Well, the brain is now associating that feeling of attraction to the act of watching porn. Also, the brain is strengthening the belief that it doesn't matter whether you worked up the courage to talk to them, 
because there's porn and that is stimulating enough. I first stumbled upon NoFap back in 2018 from a podcast I was listening to. I became curious, so I started to YouTube this NoFap thing. I came across a variety of videos of men who decided to do the strangest thing. NoFap is a movement where you abstain from masturbation and pornography. I felt oddly drawn into this trend because I knew deep deep down, that what I was doing for the past decade was wrong. For me, porn was a means to escape. It was a pull that I felt no control over. But watching porn and masturbating for a long time numbed over my feelings of guilt and shame. When you do a habit so regularly, you are not aware of a life without it. The men I was watching who are on NoFap, talking about going 10, 40, 100 days, one year without porn or masturbation, and the benefits that followed changed my perspective. It made sense, like pieces of a puzzle swept under the rug was finally being formed. But I don't beat myself up too bad about it. Porn was doing its job to lure me into its lair of unending delights like the witch in the candy house, a free-for-all online candy store designed to target our most primal brains, an online Disney world where once you leave the theme park, you have pretty bad withdrawal symptoms and do what you can to get back in. But once I saw someone describe their better world outside of that Disney world, the world outside of pornography, I felt like deep answers were pushing their way forth. I could have laughed at these men and said, this is nonsense. Porn is not harmful. I could have clicked away and gone back to my day to day. It seemed like something I would have done before when I had a static mindset not willing to accept that change is possible, or open to the idea that through change you grow and develop in character. Porn was a release. Why take away the one thing I could use to shut off my brain and escape from reality? I came to realize that because I was so deeply unhappy and full of anxiety was because I was set in my ways. If everything is not working out for me, do I wait for the world to change or do I change myself? I wanted to be like these YouTubers. They look like they climbed Mount Everest. I could see it in their eyes. They are self-assured, radiant. By eliminating this toxicity from their lives, they now exude more positivity, confidence, like they are no longer weighed down by any external force. Now that I was learning from these people, I was breaking into a new mindset, a mindset that was allowing me to reach into new unfamiliar territory, a growth mindset, understanding that we can change and it's been proven that we can. I spent a good chunk of my 20s, six years to be exact, living on Pleasure Island, not wanting to grow up, running away from challenges, dependent on external forces to make me feel good temporarily, resistant to anything outside of what I already know. And then, when my anxiety disorder got worse, I had no choice but to break outside of my usual patterns to find the answers. When you begin to look or in other words, ask the universe for help. The answers then present themselves. Chapter 3. The Dopamine Craze The paradox is that hedonism, the pursuit of pleasure for its own sake, leads to anhedonia, which is the inability to enjoy pleasure of any kind. Dr. Anna Lemke
The first few days when I attempted to stop masturbating and watching porn, I experienced much difficulty. I remember the restlessness, irritability, and the extreme desire for its use. But every part of my body wanted the fix. This is when I knew porn was a problem. It seemed like it had a strong hold over me. But why? Why did I feel like I wanted to stop, but the other part of me couldn't? Well, let's first explore the craving neurochemical in our brain, dopamine. Dopamine is associated with reward and movement. Before the age of technology, when we would have to work for our food, dopamine would be released when we would achieve goals that would satisfy our most primordial needs. Imagine what it was like back then without these super stimuli. When we would mate, it felt good. When we killed an animal, we felt the reward or discovering new land. There was that dopamine high. With mating, the association between sex and pleasure formed in the brain. That motivated us to mate again and thus spread our genes. Dopamine had its place to move us forward towards external goals like food, water, shelter, and mates to further serve us for survival purposes. It can also be viewed as the cookie crumbs that led us to our larger goals. A big dopamine blast when we would successfully bring down an animal will motivate us to go out the following day and find another. But what happens now when we add porn into the mix? Nowadays, we do not have to leave our homes to meet our survival needs. So we get those dopamine kicks from things like social media, video games, alcohol, drugs, and porn. Artificial spikes. But these kicks do not have the same dopamine spikes as gathering meat for the tribe. When we accomplish something good for our community, it motivates us to do it again in the future. But the dopamine is not pushed to its extreme. It spikes, but comes back down into this homeostasis state. When we watch porn and get that thrill, it spikes, but also we link the act of watching porn to reward. It is an artificial spike. It feels good, but is this act benefiting our higher self, our family, or our community? Or... Are you now reliant on this artificial stimuli to feel good? Back then, sex was limited, unless you were a king with all your concubines. This pleasurable act was not accessible to you at the drop of a hat, or in modern terms, a Google search away. Now, we can reward ourselves with unlimited amounts of dopamine any time of any day. Do you remember the first time you watched porn? How fast were you to revisit it? American psychologist and author Dr. Anna Lemke says so elegantly that there's a seesaw effect happening between pain and pleasure within our brains. Also, it's important to note that pain and pleasure are co-located. When you watch porn, the seesaw tilts the pleasure up and tilts the pain down. But afterwards, when you're done watching porn and you orgasm, the pleasure comes down and the pain goes up. And it's when the pain comes back up that you go and watch porn again so that you can escape that pain, to block it, to mask it. If you notice that there is a strong restlessness, urge, tug, frustration, and lackingness, after stopping porn, then that is the pain of the seesaw tilting back up. Watch porn long enough and your new normal will be those dopamine highs and anything else will feel uncomfortable. 
When you do stop a habit that has been producing such strong dopamine spikes, there will be a return to balance, homeostasis. Upon this return, the pain part of the seesaw rises. This is the hangover period post-orgasm that typically lasts for two weeks. In Marnia Robinson's book, Cupid's Poisoned Arrow, she says typical symptoms in this hangover period include a sense of lack, defensiveness, fatigue, irritation, distress, and hypersensitivity to sexual cues. And that hypersensitivity is this unconscious urge to grab onto the thing that has been firing your reward circuitry. Any incoming information that fits with the behavior that led to those dopamine spikes will be a trigger for you. Bras and underwear in the shop window, attractive people walking by you on the street, the logo of a dating app, the computer itself could all serve as the trigger. Gary Wilson, writer of Your Brain on Porn, says, Dopamine surges are the barometer by which you determine the potential value of any experience. They tell you what to approach or avoid and where to put your attention. Further, dopamine tells you what to remember by helping to rewire your brain via new or stronger nerve connections. Sexual stimulation and orgasm add up to the biggest natural blast of dopamine and opioids available to your reward circuitry. End of quote. After deciding to stop my porn use, everything from billboards to women walking on the streets would urge me back to the computer. I could feel this come down and it was blatantly obvious. An inner animal was doing what it could to get its way. It was not pleasant, to say the least. This return to balance was like climbing a mountain, building a house from scratch, or slaying the dragon. Psychologist Norman Doyage explains in his book The Brain That Changes Itself that the men at their computers looking at porn had been seduced into pornographic training sessions that met all of the conditions required for plastic change of brain maps. Since neurons that fire together wire together, these men got massive amounts of practice wiring these images into the pleasure centers of the brain with the rapt attention necessary for plastic change. Each time they felt sexual excitement and had an orgasm when they masturbated, a spritz of dopamine, the neurotransmitter, consolidated the connections made in the brain during the sessions. Not only did the reward facilitate the behavior, it provoked none of the embarrassment they felt purchasing Playboy at the store. Here was a behavior with no punishment, only reward. The content of what they found exciting changed as the websites introduced themes and scripts that altered their brains without awareness. Because plasticity is competitive, the brain maps for new, exciting images increased at the expense of what had previously attracted them. The reason, I believe, they began to find their girlfriends less of a turn-on. As for the patients who became involved in porn, most were able to go cold turkey once they understood the problem and how they were plastically reinforcing it. They found eventually that they were attracted once again to their mates. End of quote. Gary Wilson explains the effects of porn use with real relationships in his book, Your Brain on Porn. He says, Dopamine is odd. It shoots up when something is better than expected, but drops when expectations are not met. With sex, 
it's nearly impossible to match internet porn's level of surprise, variety, and novelty. Thus, once a young man thoroughly conditions himself to porn, sex may not meet his unconscious expectations. Unmet expectations produce a drop in dopamine and erections. A steady stream of dopamine surges is imperative for sustaining sexual arousal and erections. End quote. After 30 days without porn or masturbation, what happens to the seesaw of pain and pleasure? Well, it balances itself back out. Then sex with a real human being will be more stimulating and intimate. For me, post-orgasm would result in that restlessness, a sense of lacking, a crash of energy that would have to be made up for in other areas such as carb-rich foods, YouTube, or real-life drama. I'm not saying that when you go porn and masturbation free that all of these other pulls will disappear, but to some degree you will have a better hold over them. When I sacrificed porn and masturbation, I was more disciplined. With discipline comes self-respect and strength. I was more in tune with those tugging feelings, no pun intended, that drove me into those impulsive tendencies. Because I realized how challenging overcoming porn was, I became more cognizant over other masking habits that I was doing daily. But also, I realized that there is this future me, a Brad, who could have more control and balance in his life. That I am willing to give up impulsive pleasures now so that the future me can be stronger mentally and physically. So it is important to ask yourself, why am I giving up porn and masturbation? How will this benefit my future self? How will this benefit my future relationships? Sit and write this out. It's crucial to know why you are on this path. Then I want you to write, what will happen if I don't stop porn and masturbating? What will this future me look like? What will my relationships be like if I continue? Attaching pain to not changing will help propel you towards your goals. Keep your aim in sight at all times and remember why you're on this path of recovery. Chapter 4. Recovery We have been taught that freedom is the freedom to pursue our petty, trivial desires. Real freedom is freedom from our petty, trivial desires. Russell Brand I used to live in a way that every second of my day was spent in distraction. Distracted by social media, video games, YouTube, and porn. Whenever there was a moment of free time, my mind would pull me into something else. I had no me time. Frankly, I didn't even know who I was and what it felt like to have quality time with myself. I was very uncomfortable being in my own skin. Partly, it was the fact that I was continuously feeling sorry for myself and doing things every day, like watching porn, that made me feel guilty, ashamed, and weak. If I were in tune with myself, then I would have known that what I've been doing was only harming my higher self, that I was dependent on these external forces. Regaining control of what is tempting requires you to let go of the thing you conditioned yourself to enjoy. It is a mountain, a mission, a goal like no other. When I was going two weeks without porn, my mind was doing whatever it could to get back to it. And yes, it got its way sometimes. And within those gaps of time without porn, I was slowly expanding my distance 
from the thing. But when those setbacks happened, I was devastated. I felt like a failure. The huge boulder I was carrying up the mountain slipped from my grasp and it rolled down to the bottom. I had to start from square one again. When this happens, it's useful to spend that time reflecting back on the distance you already covered. How many days of the week were you watching porn before? Seven? How many days did you go without it? Ten? Fifty? A hundred? What an unbelievable improvement. What a massive change. Failure is an important part of recovery. When you have a setback, you feel what? Pain? We humans do whatever we can to avoid pain as much as possible. This setback could unconsciously be an indicator that this is not what you want. So feel it. It sucks to work hard for something greater than yourself and then fall back to the bottom. But look how far up you climbed already. If I were to not fail in my nofap journey, that means I would not have tried in the first place. I want to conclude this audiobook with a few strategies I found useful in my recovery. The first is to spend more time with others. Why? Well, for me, I made the association of being alone to watching porn. If I wasn't alone, I didn't feel as motivated to watch porn as before. During recovery, when I was left home alone, I would go to the coffee shop or the library and read. The trigger of being home alone fired in my brain to watch porn, but the act of me leaving the house began to break up the old behavior with a new one. The next strategy I suggest is to watch your mentors talk about NoFap on YouTube when you get that urge. It is easy to forget why you are on this journey, to say hell with it and pull up your favorite porn site. But it requires that awareness of the urge so that you can shift your actions to something that serves your higher self. Like looking up to your mentors on YouTube. That's what they are. Mentors. The ultimate judges. The ones who stir up your inadequacies and show you that there is a better life to be had if only you just orient yourself properly. When you begin the recovery journey, you are going to stumble about before you get better. You conditioned yourself to this habit for a long time. For me, it was 12 years. 12 years of ingraining this programming deep within my brain tissues. A pathway built so strong, it will take time and perseverance to break. I had to chip away at this pathway for months. When the urge to watch porn arose, I would pull up YouTube and watch my mentors. They reminded me why I was doing this in the first place. Watching them helped break up the association between the urge and watching porn. By watching my newly found mentors, I was telling my unconscious mind that this is what I want. I want to get to where they are. I want to feel what they feel. What we act out determines what we value. So the act of going to the gym, going to the coffee shop, looking for online courses, going for a drive, meditating, cooking, instead of engaging in porn, tells the unconscious mind that I value this over porn. The less you engage in porn, the less and less you value it. Next, I found that talking about my addiction with someone helped with my recovery journey. Whether it is someone you trust online or a close friend, admitting to them that you had a problem with pornography 
can be freeing. When I was addicted, it greatly impacted my relationships. So at one point, I had to revisit, through a mental exercise, my past partners, family, and friends whom I have harmed because of my porn use. This was no easy exercise. Admitting to them of my insecurities and flaws brought about stored emotions. Healing requires you to mend past wounds, to show the parts of you stuck in the past that you can in fact move forward. And to move forward requires you to understand why you caused pain to others. So now I want to guide you through this very exercise that I used to heal myself of past discrepancies and wrongdoings. The pain that I inflicted upon others because of my dependencies and lack of willpower. So now sit comfortably in a safe space where you won't be distracted. Sit upright and close your eyes. Let us start off with some deep breathing. Breathe in through the nose for three seconds, belly rise, then out through the nose for five. If it is uncomfortable to breathe in through the nose, you can breathe in through the mouth, that's fine. Breathe in and breathe out for five. Breathe in for three and breathe out for five. Breathe in. And out. Now that you're feeling more relaxed, imagine a ball of healing light surrounding you. Imagine this light healing you up from head to toe, then from toes to your head. Feel that healing energy, how it's making you feel safe. As you watch this healing light fill you up, make sure your breathing is still three seconds in and five seconds out. Now I want you to make a stage in front of you. And I want you to bring out someone from your life onto this stage. Someone you want to release heavy emotional ties with. Bring them out onto the stage and imagine a line of healing light going from your heart to their heart, healing up their body from head to toe. You and this person are both in this healing process. One one with each other. Then I want you to say to this person, please forgive me. I also forgive you. And send your healing light from your heart to their heart, letting it fill them up. And then I want you to imagine them saying it back to you. Please forgive me. I also forgive you. 
Now imagine their healing light going from them back into your heart. Imagine you giving them a hug and telling them once again, please forgive me, I also forgive you. After the hug, I want you to step away from the person and I want you to say to them anything that you want to say, anything that comes up from your unconscious mind, speak to them. Let them know how you feel or what you feel. Express to them an unresolved tension that you may have been carrying for a long time. If any emotions come up, let them come up. That's a sign of release. After you say what you need to say to them, step away and then go back in for another hug and tell them, please forgive me, I also forgive you. Give them another hug and imagine them saying it back to you, please forgive me, I also forgive you. Now thank them for being in your life and on this stage and for the valuable lessons you learned. Then imagine a beam of light coming down from the top of the screen and severing the line between your heart and their heart. And how does that feel now that this line has been severed and things have been resolved? Imagine the person disappearing from your mind's eye and sit with these feelings. It could be lighter feelings, like a weight's been lifted off your shoulders. Then continue to breathe in for three. And out for five. In for three. And out for five. Now, whenever you feel ready, wiggle your toes, wiggle your fingers, and come back into the present moment. Great work. Now, to conclude this chapter, I want to talk about the power of surrender. When we try to fight a thought, a feeling, we lose. Why? We are adding more stress and anxiety onto the already existing stress. We are adding pain 
to the pain. So what if we relax out of the feeling instead of fueling it? Yogis and spiritual teachers talk about letting go to free ourselves of this attachment. Remember, the more we fight the thought, emotion, feeling, the more it persists. It's a losing battle. So when the pain arises, that feeling of wanting to watch porn, I want you to let it come up. How do you do that? There is this insistent, chattering voice in our heads. This voice has been telling you what you want and don't want your entire life. There may be so much thinking going on that you can't even tell it's there. Those are reflexive thoughts, well-practiced thoughts. But what if you engaged in a different voice, a voice you control, So when that strong desire to watch porn comes about, you now engage in that new voice, a voice that will let go and relax you out of this strong energy, this pull. For me, I would say to myself, so what? Then, after saying this, I feel the anger and frustration bubble up even more. Then, I will say it again, so what? There will be a part of you that will want to push the pain back down. But it's crucial to let it flow through you as you repeat the mantra. Then, you may experience a long exhale, a deeper breath, a shiver. That is your body releasing this stored up energy. That is is letting go. Suppressing or fighting that energy only builds upon its stress and thus increases its weight. This is a relaxation strategy. We are activating the rest and digest system. By letting the energy come up, you have an opportunity to release it. There are only two options, isn't there? engaging in this feeling which in turn only keeps it around or you can let it go. You will notice that the thoughts and feelings of wanting to watch porn do not survive long the more you engage in this mantra. Keep repeating the mantra until the thoughts disappear. Do this long enough and the thoughts and desires come about less often, until one day they do not come up at all. You have to be persistent. The mind is an eight-year-old child that needs discipline. The mind will catch you when you are at your weakest and then exploit your weaknesses. When you let your guard down and invite the desire inside to dance, you're most likely going to lose. Your intention must be firm. I am not a porn watcher. I want to live porn free. Tell that incessant chattering voice inside what's what, because the more you do, the more it understands. Now, here is spiritual teacher Michael Singer on letting go. This is taken from his book, the untethered soul. When you feel pain, simply view it as energy. Just start seeing these inner experiences as energy passing through your heart and before the eye of your consciousness. Then relax. Do the opposite of contracting and closing. Relax and release. Relax your heart until you are actually face-to-face with the exact place where it hurts. Stay open and receptive so you can be present right where the tension is. You must be willing to be present right at the place of the tightness and pain, and then relax and go even deeper. This is a very deep growth and transformation but you will not want to do this. 
you will feel tremendous resistance to doing this. And that's what makes it so powerful. As you relax and feel the resistance, the heart will want to pull away, to close, to protect, and to defend itself. Keep relaxing. Relax your shoulders and relax your heart. Let go and give room for the pain to pass through you. It's just energy. Just see it as energy and let go. Chapter 5. Leaving Neverland You become what you give your attention to. Epictetus We live today with non-stop distractions, those constant notifications from our phones to junk foods and Netflix. We can numb ourselves so easily from the inner critic within. But what happens if you continue to shy away from the pain? to avoid any hard thinking or hard work, to avoid discomfort and uneasiness? Do we actually increase our sensitivity to negative emotions and that discomfort? The answer is yes. The more you avoid it, the bigger the dragon grows. But we don't always see the dragon when it's a baby, do we? Or do we acknowledge it and then sweep it under the rug as quickly as possible? Suppress it. When I look back at the beginning of my porn addiction, I can see myself noticing the guilt, shame, and weakness that came about from watching porn. A part of me didn't want to do it, while the other part said, Yes, it feels too good. Keep going. That would be my dopamine tilting its way upwards telling me this is rewarding. It's worth doing again. But now, going on three years of NoFap, I feel more freedom in having control from my impulsive tendencies. The pain of the seesaw inside my brain is not tilting too far into pain because I'm not tilting it too far into pleasure. In fact, because I'm not stimulating myself with endless amounts of women online, I am more stimulated by the beauty and connection with my partner. That simple kiss, hug, touch, cuddle becomes more sensitive. She is real, not the fairy of porn that you find in the Peter Pan story. Remember that story? A real woman? Wendy comes into Peter Pan's life. She wants kids, a partner to spend her life with. But Peter doesn't want to grow up. He is not interested in that responsibility. He wants to remain king of the Lost Boys on Pleasure Island. Lost Boys is another way of saying losers, isn't it? Like Malfoy from Harry Potter, who is king of Crab and Goyle or Scar from the Lion King who rules over the hyenas. It's not a worthwhile aim, because like Malfoy or Scar, Peter refuses to acknowledge any sort of ideal in his life. The reason? They will bring out all of Peter's faults and insecurities. So in his eyes, it's better to be king of the losers rather than to be nothing at all. And then he has this fairy for whom is not real, Tinkerbell. She is part of Peter's imagination, similar to porn in how it's not real. He would rather stick to the fairy of porn than to be with somebody real. To be with a Wendy requires him to take on responsibility, to grow up, to give up being king of the Lost Boys and Tinkerbell. But like myself, back before I started NoFap, why put in the work when you can enjoy all the pleasures on the internet? Why face the challenges of a real relationship? Well, when you are disciplined with NoFap, you discover a new world. A world without pornography. A world where you can enhance the quality of your relationships. And as you begin NoFap, 
You have a goal to strive towards. And as you get closer to the goal, you get those dopamine spurts that signal growth, that you are doing something larger than yourself. It toughens you up. It increases your pain tolerance because it's easy to sit and watch porn and fap all day. But to struggle and overcome something that has been keeping you dependent is truly an accomplishment. Because in the end, is porn benefiting you, your family, and the community? If you answer no, then why not sacrifice porn and see how your life and the relationships around you improve? I believe porn is something we have to grow out of. It's a habit that needs to die off. For Peter Pan, one sacrifice that will make him into a real boy is to give up Tinkerbell. She's a figment of his imagination and the obstacle in the way of establishing a true connection with Wendy. There is a time in your 20s when you have to give up this vacancy on Pleasure Island. Do you think others like to be around a 20-year-old, 30-year-old, or a 20-year-old, 50-year-old? Porn is a habit that makes up the impulsive personality. Someone who keeps living on Pleasure Island. Living porn-free means that you value real experiences rather than artificial and objectifying ones. That you value discipline rather than floating around in life. Living the no-fap lifestyle means you are more conscientious of what manipulates and pulls you. That is freedom. You can avoid pain and discomfort in the future if you are willing to sacrifice what's here in the present. So, what are you willing to sacrifice. The end.